The elusive prophecies of Revelation have been an enigma to most for several centuries at least. It seems the more we get closer to modern times, the more information we have lost regarding the understanding of biblical geography and prophecy many times. We prove this many times over on this channel, and so do others. But are those days changing? Are the modern dark ages over? Are we in the days of increasing knowledge as predicted by Daniel? Or better, is all evil being exposed with the light of the truth? We believe we are entering those days, and we believe it is time to know how to interpret Revelation 12. We are the God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the Word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now, we have fully tested the woman, Israel, who appeared in heaven along with the complete symbology that surrounds her, the Son, Jacob, Israel, and on earth. She is clothed or protected by the land of the Son, the Philippines. The moon is Rachel, the mother, in which Philippines is the mother of all lands, the land of creation, Elda, and mother of all humans, Havila or Hava, Eve or Hawa, if you want to say it completely correctly in ancient Hebrew, and it just so happens that the largest moon called population on the earth is right there at the foot of the woman in the southern Philippines and the entire nation of Indonesia. Number one Muslim population on earth. The 12 stars in her crown are the 12 burning islands of Babuyan, also meaning gateway or portal. And the man-child is the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel, which someone actually questioned us, how could Israel have children that were Israel? Really? She could have nothing else, in fact. But see, those are things that are taught in different prophecy circles, yet they defy logic, don't they? This children's worship army of 144,000 will be the most miraculous sight and sound the world has ever seen. Just as 5,000 worshipers at King Solomon's coronation actually caused the earth to shake. Imagine what 144,000 with an anointed song from the throne room of Yahuwah himself is going to do. And now it's time for the final characters in this story. And we're going to go into chapter 13, just the first verse or so, just to pull this all together. Now, some get edgy when we dare cover Satan in any sense, but we really aren't concerned with anything but the truth here. And to cover this passage and not recognize that it happens to place him as the antagonist in the story would truly just be a misrepresentation. There's truly nothing scary about Satan, really. I mean, he really shouldn't scare us. We have authority over him. No matter what form he's in, we have authority over him, period. He is temporary and he will lose. And those believers who intend to live forever Realize, he is really meaningless in the long run. However, his role here is not only important in understanding the passage. We believe it assists us in identifying the land where some of these events occur, specifically the beast who rises out of the sea. I know, many have probably heard the prophecy school line that the word sea has to mean multitude. Not a literal sea, of course, yet we will look at the actual word and prove that wrong. And let's see if that definition ever fits the Hebrew or the Greek at all. So why do we continue to listen to so-called scholarship with no foundation in Scripture? Well, our job 
is to listen, but to test everything. And that is what we do here, and many who follow us do as well. Well, it's fine to hear them out and then test what they're saying with Scripture for yourself. They don't get to create a paradigm without supporting it. And it is time we all hold them to that. Now, let's jump in. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto Yahuwah and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood." And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of its mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we know scripture says the great red dragon is the devil and Satan the old serpent. And that is indisputable. We don't dispute that a bit. We prove that out, and we already have. Those looking for everything to be a symbol and not literal in the book of Revelation may want to realize that is a false paradigm proven by this passage, in fact, as this is not a symbol, but exactly as it says, it's Satan the devil. That's what it says. And where is he? Well, he appears in heaven, to go after the man-child as soon as he is birthed. He is clearly very threatened by this male child, or the 144,000, isn't he? Why? Well, he wishes to consume the first fruits offering 
to Yahuwah and Yahusha. And it does scare him. Remember, he is at the point where he wishes to set his throne above Yahuwah now. And he already knows one third of the angels are with him because he does know prophecy, even if we don't. Yahuwah takes the child and Satan and his angels, who had not fallen yet at that point, start the first war in heaven. There is no other such war on record. Fallen angels, yes, but even the watchers who created the Nephilim, basically, procreated the Nephilim with women, human women, did not war in heaven. There's no such account in any of those stories. No war, period, in heaven. Didn't happen. They went after mankind on earth, but not in heaven. They dare not attempt such. So they instead send Enoch before Yahuwah with a petition to save their children because they were afraid of Yahuwah, which Yahuwah rejected their request and pronounced their coming imprisonment and final judgment to come. Did they then fight? Did they go to heaven and war? No. They were shaking in fear. That's not war. Other angels were judged along the way as well, and especially the book of Enoch does record some. But they were imprisoned for refusing to perform their functions. But again, none of them, according to the accounts, started a war in heaven. It's just not there. This is an event that hasn't happened yet. And if Satan was kicked out of heaven... How did he get there in Job after the flood? And how does he enter again? And why does this passage say he is still at the point, at that point, accusing the brethren before Yahuwah day and night, all the way up until that point? Well, if this happened between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, there were no people yet. So who's he accusing? No one? See, it just doesn't fit in any sense if you look at it logically. And those saying that this has already passed, do you recognize? You are saying we are no longer being accused? Of course we are. And the tribulation would have to have already begun, according to this passage, because that's when this happens. And we would recognize the two witnesses in Jerusalem already, for one. Satan still has access to heaven all the way up until this point. And there really is nothing there to justify that this supposedly happened before creation, nor during period, nor even in the Garden of Eden. No. In fact, John tells us in Revelation 1.1, and a lot miss this, many who want to go backwards and say, oh, well, this is of, of, of things that happened before, or, you know, the woman is Mary and the, the man-child is, is Jesus. Well, there's a massive problem with that because John says otherwise. He wrote the book. He's the author. This is a book of coming events according to Revelation 1.1, not past events. That's what he says in his own words, and we need to keep that perspective in mind when interpreting the book of Revelation. So this is a coming event. Unless one can prove it already happened since John wrote it, maybe, which they cannot. It's time to read Scripture as it is and allow Scripture to interpret Scripture and steer away from strange doctrine, which has no basis in logic nor Scripture. Satan and his angels are cast to the earth, and he is angry because he knows he has lost access to heaven, and that his time is short because, see, he knows prophecy. Again, even if we don't. He immediately goes to attack the woman with a tsunami out of his mouth. Yes, literally. He's a powerful angel, and yes, he can do so without it needing to be allegory. Of course, he fails, and the woman is saved and taken to the wilderness by the great eagle's wings. The Philippine eagle, that is. It's the largest on earth. So, it appears he gives up knowing he can't reach the woman, which says much about that land as a haven for Israel, for the remnant, which it has been 
actually all alone. In fact, Ophir was truly Israel's only long-term ally, if you really think about it. Satan then goes to the rest of the world to make war with a remnant of the seed of the woman. Who is her seed? Tribes of Israel. And yes, other believers will be persecuted indeed and martyred. Yes, absolutely, as they are grafted into the kingdom. But chapters don't actually exist in the original scripture. And this story is not over as of chapter 12, as it continues in the first part, especially, of chapter 13. So let's keep reading just a little, and we'll pull this all together. And this will make sense. You don't have to agree with this, but it will be proven out and make sense. We are not going to identify the beast in this video as a certain person. We're, we're not going to go toward a world leader or anything like that. Not in this video. We are interested in this video in locating the land in which this narrative plays out on, based on our findings thus far, basically. So where is John in this vision at this point, at the end of chapter 12? Well, he is still in the land that protects the woman, which is the Philippines. Remember that. Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, this is the famous verse of the first beast. Some call the Antichrist or the Anti-Messiah. And many, many scholars apply this phrase, sand of the sea and or then the word sea later as meaning a multitude of people. But let's test that. The Greek word used for sand is amos, meaning sand, as heaped on a beach. And it bears that definition every time it's used, which is five times in the New Testament. So, does sand mean multitude or people? Either one? Not according to its definition. And look also at the Hebrew. Sand is used 23 times, and every single time it also means sand. What about the word for sea? In the original Greek, it's thalassa, meaning the sea, all 92 times that it is used. In the New Testament, the word sea always means sea. Even in the Hebrew, most all the references mean sea. Sometimes it means west. But understand, where was the sea in relation to Israel? Well, the big one, west, the Mediterranean. And there was another sea to the south, and you even see one tie there where the word means south, referring to the South Sea or the Red Sea. It is used for seafaring people once, but that's not precedence and would require much more than that to jump into Revelation and apply this so. So where does this thinking come from then? Well, there are passages using especially the phrase sand of the sea as a clear analogy as no one can number the sand of the sea, which is true. But sand of the sea still retains its meaning in those passages. It does not become other words and meanings and other words are there to qualify it so. It's still sand and it's still sea, not people, not multitude, which are other Greek and Hebrew words which accompany sand of the sea in those passages. But those words are not here in Revelation 13.1, so one cannot apply them if they are not there. Let's look at a few and see for yourself if this is a reasonable interpretation. Romans 9.27 Isaiah, Isaiah, also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. See, sand of the sea here is literally referring to the many grains of sand on the sea. But notice the other words which accompany it, which are not found in Revelation 13.1, the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. See the qualifiers there. In Revelation 13.1, we are missing the number or multitude of the children of Israel. People, both, are missing 
in that passage. So no, it cannot be redefined to match this one. When this passage says sand of the sea, just means sand of the sea. It requires further language to qualify it so, which here makes a very direct comparison, but again, that is missing from Revelation 13.1, so one cannot view it that way. It requires adding words to the passage that are not there. Hebrews 11.12, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude. Notice this requires the word multitude not found in Revelation 13.1. And as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Again, that word innumerable also missing in Revelation 13.1. Notice the same here, the descriptive language of sand of the sea shore as well as stars of the sky, do not individually mean a multitude of people unless there are other words there to demonstrate this. Here we have the word multitude, not found in Revelation 13.1, as well as the word for innumerable. So, when it says John stood on the sand of the sea, he was not standing on a multitude of people, as both of those words aren't even in the passage, nor does that beast rise out of a multitude of people. It's really the sea and sand of the sea in both cases, just as it reads, very literal. Even later in Revelation 20, we see the same, and shall go out to deceive the nations, now that's Satan now, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Note, the number of whom, denoting multitude of people, is not found in Revelation 13.1. And there you have it again, the number of whom. Does Revelation 13.1 say the number of whom is as the sand of the sea? No, it just says the sand of the sea. If it does not, then sand of the sea does not stand on its own in interpretation as a multitude of people. It requires additional language not found in Revelation 13.1. Hopefully, this is clear now. Let's move forward. Back to our passage, the beginning is, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. This says exactly what it says. It's straightforward. John was standing on the shore of the land which protects the woman. Go back to the end of chapter 12. That's where we pick up. And Satan was actually in the water, even at that point. If you go back to the end of the previous verse, as he just tried to cast a tsunami out of his mouth toward the woman and that land, which failed. Now, without going deeper in this video into the four beasts of Daniel, the world empire from the statue, and all of those things, we just wish to test the geography of this passage. Where does this occur on earth? Can we know? We believe we can. Now we get into detail. This is a map of the South China Sea showing disputed territories, which we will cover a little. But we aren't entering politics. We don't really do that here. The wilderness that protects the woman we identified in the last video as the only desert in the Philippines, just south of Lawag, on the northwestern tip of Luzon Island. John is standing on that seashore somewhere when he sees the beast rising out of the sea. The dragon, Satan, not the beast, they are separate characters, though the dragon will give the beast power, is still in the sea, having created a tsunami, tsunami which failed to attack the woman. And that is when the beast rises from the sea. What sea? Well, the same one John is looking at in his vision, based on where he is located at that point. 
which hasn't changed again. There are no chapters in the Bible. Those were added. The writing flows, and many times the break in chapters is not always the best place. It's okay, but we need to understand that when we are reading it. This is the same one that the devil is still in. Now, these circles represent disputed territories, which China is claiming, and voila, it just happens that the beast will rise and Satan will operate from that same area, basically. Hmm. We don't know 100% that this is Scarborough Shoal, for instance, where we place them, but it does fit, especially when you look at the local names of that place, and we will get there. Here's a brief breakdown of the South China Sea dispute. China, you know all the way up north, lays claim to all of the seas within this red dotted line, claiming history supports such, yet it really does not seem to. Now, notice China's border ends at Hainan Island. UN law does not support their claim typically, as it basically identifies the green line as their border. But look at the figure they have drawn here. Sure seems they are wagging their tongue, literally, as it looks like one, doesn't it? Kind of like the beast? Hmm. No matter. We don't cover politics, and you may be surprised that we actually think this may be a fulfillment of prophecy setting up for the last days and this very scenario. So those attempting to use our research for political reasons, forget about it. Specifically, though, we are interested in the area known as Scarborough Shoal, as well as the Spratly Islands, even though, even according to UN law, these both really fall in Philippine territory, maybe some of the Spratly Islands into Malay, I don't know. But China has seized them. And again, there may be nothing the Philippines can do to get them back. And it may actually be that they are not supposed to in this case. Odd we would say that, we know. But check this out. Now, we aren't entering political debate again. But here's what we find very interesting about this. Where was John at the end of chapter 12? He was in the land that protects the woman in his vision. She is taken to the wilderness, which is on the west coast of Luzon, likely. And that is where John is standing when he sees the beast rise out of the sea. He's standing on the sand of the shore, the seashore, there. And he sees the beast rise. Now... This is a vision, so certainly John can be transfigured elsewhere, no doubt, but there's nothing to indicate that, only that he's still in the same spot. This really seems to be a continuation of the previous chapter, not a new one, really, and probably not a good place to break it. What's really weird is out in that sea, the dragon, Satan, just sent a tsunami that the earth swallowed, meaning Satan, the dragon, is still in the South China Sea at this point of the story. So, if John is standing on the western shore of Luzon Island in the Philippines, then what exactly is he looking at? Well, again, the South China Sea, as he literally watches this first beast rise out of the literal sea there. As we said, Satan, the great red dragon, is at this point in the passage, still in the exact sea, same place, and then we see the beast rising out of it at the same time that he is there, same sea, South China Sea. That is no coincidence, it's planned, and that is likely why China, the nation, not its people, who have no idea what the real agenda is, nor are they a part of it, may be seizing this land. Understand our intention here is to identify this sea and land from which the beast rises. 
It in no way implicates any of us regular folk who are not involved at the highest levels of government. And let's be clear, governments for the most part represent the interests of those at the top and very rarely those of us regular people anyway. That's just fact. We are not talking about a people group here. We are talking about the stage where this scene plays out in the future and the people of that country will not really be involved nor even know what is going on for the most part. They don't get a say. They don't know what's going on. And this is in no way a reflection on them, nor are we calling them evil either, nor Satan, nor the beast. No, we are not saying that. Those are literal characters who will deceive the whole world practically, not just the people of that country, by the way. Believers all over the earth, including China and governments, are largely controlled by the same interests and a small group of elites. Elites that wish to bring about their Messiah, whom this beast will fit like a glove. Why would we say this is the possible area where the beast would rise? Remember Enoch which we shared before, says there are 12 portals in the east. We identified what could be one location in the crown of stars over the head of the Philippines, the Babuyan Islands, meaning gateway or portal even. Again, even if we go there, doubt we are going to be able to enter that portal even so. So, not going to be able to prove that out. But it is an interesting connection, as is this. Could the Scarborough Shoal or somewhere around that area have some sort of markers to better identify this? For those who are familiar with CERN, an operation on the border of France and Switzerland, which purposes to open a portal, in fact, The project is expanding, but guess who just so happens to be planning to build the very largest particle collider to open a portal in history? Well, China, of course. Now, they haven't announced where they would build it, but we sure do wonder if that is not a connection here as it's really uh, intended to open a portal to another dimension, to send things through or receive something or someone, at least in the words of those who run the CERN project. It's an interesting thought. We cannot prove out, nor have we seen this operate, but odd that in lieu of everything else, China, of all places, is planning on building the largest portal at that. Now, we can't say this for sure on this, but we are telling you, keep your eye on this one. Why? Well, the clues are found in the local names for Scarborough Shoal. Check this out. This cannot be a coincidence. This is interesting. In the Philippines, they call this reef Panatag Shoal. Just a coincidence? that we explore from time to time, Pana has likely origins in Hebrew. It means to turn toward, or rather, to bend, or incline. Wait a minute. Incline? You mean like ascend or rise? Hmm. Isn't that exactly what the beast will do? Rise out of the sea? Fascinating. Not simply a swirl or arbitrary tilt, but rather a deliberate alteration of a course of progression toward a newly declared and desired objective. Wait, you mean like a complete change in the world order? A new direction or objective? Does that not fit the beast as well? Hmm. Our verb is used... To describe natural features turning toward a certain direction, a path turning into a better direction, or worse, a vine's branches turning toward a tending eagle, a person turning into some, for onlookers, unexpected direction, 
an enemy turning away from the victim. Hmm. Or folks turning toward achieving a situation or help and turn to fake gods. You mean like the guy who will declare he is God in the temple in Jerusalem? That's an awful lot of a coincidence, don't you think? And we find that in the South China Sea, right where we have identified the beast will rise. And in a disputed territory, no less, taken over by the great red dragon, which we will cover. Yeah, we are not going to ignore that. Let's vet this further, though. This next one, though, is going to really get you scratching your head. How does stuff like this get right past us all of us, so often. This is interesting. The Chinese name for Scarborough Shoal is Huangyan, which in lieu of the circumstances is an awfully peculiar meaning. In Chinese, it means lie, falsehood, fib, fairy tale. Are you kidding me? How could the media overlook something like that? Yet, they do. Now, more specifically though, this ties to the beast. Why? Because it's actually two words with a little different meaning when you put them together. Huang, which is lie by itself. So, to call the whole word just lie is not quite the full definition, is it? And yan meaning to talk, to speak, say, word. So basically it means to speak lies. Blasphemies? Hmm. What does the Bible say the beast will do? Well, he will speak lies and blasphemies. He will also rise from the sea, and yet here you have the Filipino word originating in Hebrew meaning rise. And the Chinese meaning to speak lies. Wow. Sometimes we cover stuff like this and people watch and comment based on one point. But we don't make one point. We compile a case based on research of facts. No one has to agree with everything we conclude, but no one can say we don't support our positions. And we're well on our way here. And by the way, even as of November a few months ago, China was still controlling this area and even drove out a Filipino news station for that matter. Interesting. So why China? Are there other markers tying China to the dragon and the beast? Again, not the Chinese people. We're talking about governments here. And the Chinese government was taken over a very long time ago. 200 years ago, at least, and we'll show you. Well, what did Revelation 12 call Satan? Well, the great red dragon. Now, that is the devil in this passage, as it says. So, we are not disputing that. However, just as there is symbology, identifying the land of the woman, which further identifies which sea from which the beast rises... China is also known as the Great Red Dragon. Is that because it's Satan? No, we are not saying that. He uses all governments, so let's be clear on that. But for this narrative, that is yet another indisputable tie. But some out there will say, no, China is not the Great Red Dragon. Well, let's prove this out. Is it? As we covered before, the word great is an indication of the largest in many cases. Is China not the largest nation on earth? Well, indeed it is. Therefore, great certainly applies. Now, some debate back and forth about whether China is a red dragon, or maybe it's a yellow dragon, or whatever. But that's a meaningless puppet show. Let's break down each word. Is China associated with the color red? 
Well, it is called Red China, after all. The color of communism is red, and so is the flag, and many other things, including the red dragon, whom was used by the very first Chinese emperor. But again, we don't have to prove that route. Is China red? Yes, indisputably so. Finally, is China associated with the dragon? Well, it's only the national animal, though supposedly mythical. It's in the Chinese zodiac, and many emperors have used, in many ways, dragons as symbols. So, is China the great, yes, red, yes, dragon? The answer, yes, it is. Is it Satan? Again, we're not saying that. But it is a nation which will serve his purpose in the end, as many will. And we are already well on our way to proving that. But just a quick one. We chose this website because it represents both the Chinese and foreign perspective here and was approved by giant companies in both who are very politically correct. It's called China, the land of the red dragon. Again, we don't need great because we all know China is the largest country, thus great already. And who is this behind this website? Well, just Kim China and Adama, an Israeli company who formed an alliance in China, and they together are celebrating the Chinese culture as the red dragon of history. So yes, China is also the red dragon. But no matter, now we are only warming up on proving this out as the evidence is very abundant. And the next video, which we are already recording, will be twice as long as this one. And we will fully prove this out. Don't try to debate us yet, but wait for that and review all the evidence first. For those in the Philippines, this is not news to fear. Remember, the dragon attempts to attack the Philippines with a tsunami, but the earth opens and swallows it. Satan then leaves and goes into the rest of the earth to make war with the remnant. The next video is coming right behind this one. Thank you for watching our Solomon's Gold series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell. Share this video with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah bless. Ladies and gentlemen, a special message. I am Timothy, founding member of The God Culture and Solomon's Gold series. We as a group thought it was time for me to introduce myself as we are now bringing conferences to the Philippines and I will be there and look forward to meeting you. For the past two years, the God Culture YouTube channel has received amazing support from so many and we thank you. We just recently surpassed 4 million views in less than two years and that far exceeds our expectations. Thank you all. Even via email, we have had several offers to give money to support this ministry, and until now, we have not needed. And still, for the function of our YouTube channel, we are pleased to say that we still do not need. However, we realize the importance of expanding, especially Solomon's Gold series, beyond YouTube in the Philippines, as we truly want to reach everyone we possibly can get to. With the restoration of the history of Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish, Havilah, the Garden of Eden, and the land of creation. In fact, after two years, no one has proven any of these findings wrong. And that is because they are truth. We are pleased to announce RISE Philippines Conferences beginning May 2019 this year. We have partnered with Filipino pastor Paul Madrano, who is a pastor and Bible school director 
and teacher overseas. We already have more than 12 locations tentatively booked for these conferences in Luzon, May 1st through 12th, Cebu, May 14th through 17th, and Mindanao, May 18th through 20th. To start, just in the month of May alone, and our intention is to continue from there. We will announce firm dates and venues as soon as possible. In efforts to bring these conferences free to the public in the Philippines, we now need your help to assist in underwriting the cost of these events, and not for the channel. Therefore, we have set up a Patreon account by which you can give monthly to this effort if you are led, and 100% of these monies will go toward conferences in the Philippines. This in no way affects the channel, and we will continue with those videos free of charge. So here's your opportunity to join The God Culture and give not just for these conferences, but also toward future conferences, and you can reach us at thegodculture at gmail.com if you wish to host a conference in your area as well. Patreon allows us to set up monthly giving levels starting at as low as $5 US per month. We are unable to set up multiple currencies or receive cash, though you can also give at the conferences. Just click the link in the description box below this video or fast forward to the end screen of this video and there is a give button there which hyperlinks to our Patreon page. For all who give, we will post the donors at each conference. Again, you do not have to do this in order to continue receiving our videos free of charge, but if you wish, to support the effort to bring RISE Philippines conferences to the Philippines, we would appreciate the help. Yahuwah bless you and your families, and thank you again for being a part of this effort.